Um, I didn't tell anybody what I was going to be talking about today, but I'm telling you, we could not have organized it better to lead up to this subject. Um, it's just, I was standing out there telling my wife, or she was probably over here me say it. I can't believe it. this is amazing. Like God is awesome. It's like he knows what he's doing. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about a subject today that it's really basic. And if you've been a Christian for a long time, you've probably heard some of these words. But I feel like we lose the gravity of this because we've become so familiar with it. And um, someone shared a word with, you this, with me this morning that um, they saw a big white door with the big window in it and the light was coming in. And so people could see and there was light. But t- this morning, God was going to open the door and let more light come in. Okay? So just be prepared. That's what God's going to do in us today. So if we can, um, can you turn to the first slide, um, John chapter 1? The title of the topic today is um, Born of Spirit, and we're talking about what God did to you, which is what Rebecca just said. So John chapter 1, 11 through 13, it says, Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So this verse tells us that if we come to Jesus and we receive him and we believe in his name, that's our part, something happens to us. We become born of God, and we are now children of God. Can you go to the um, John 3? Okay. So here is a, a, I think when I was a little kid, this was the first Bible verse we always had to memorize, John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, But he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, when I was a little kid, we had a a revival preacher that came to our uh, Baptist church out in the country. And this man was scary. (laughs) And he got up and he he preached on going to hell and um, the fire of hell and all this kind of stuff. And it terrified me. But he said, if you believe in Jesus, then you don't have to do that. You don't have to go to that awful place. So I believed him. Okay? So I went home one night after this. We had, he, was, he spoke seven days in a row, I believe. Um, so one night I went home and I was like, Jesus, I believe you. Please don't let me go to that awful place. Okay? So that, that kind of preaching, I guess you can say it is effective. But what it produced in me was a wrong view of God's character. See, the way I, could you put that verse back up there again? To me, it seemed like, for God was so mad at the world. God was so angry at the sin of the world. That's not what it says. It says God loved the world. God loved the world that was full of sinners. For God so loved the world, but I thought it said, for God was so angry at the world, that if you would beg and plead and live right, and read your Bible, and live holy, he would let you into heaven, but he's still kind of mad. (laughs) I meet so many people that approach God that way. That God's mad, and if we can just stay under the radar, maybe he'll pick on somebody else. (laughs) This says the exact opposite of that. 
God loved the world without asking them if it was okay. This is a decision that God made that you have nothing to do with. God loved the world. Now it says that um, whoever believes in him should not perish, and that he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. I wish the church would understand that. That Jesus did not come to earth on a finger-pointing mission. He came to earth on a rescue mission. Right? Jesus came to rescue people who could not do it right. Now let's do some math here on verse 18. It says, if you believe in Jesus, you're not condemned. But if you don't believe, then you're condemned already. So here's the math. If you believe, that equals not condemned. Okay? And if you don't believe, then you are condemned already. Is that what that says, John? It says, he who believes in him is not condemned. That's that equation. And he who does not believe is condemned already because they haven't believed in Jesus. Tell me where in this math is your behavior? It's not in there. Your behavior has absolutely zero to do with whether or not you're condemned. Hallelujah. Do you believe it? If you believe in Jesus, you will never, ever be condemned. Ever. That is awesome. That is just awesome. I'll tell you what, in case there's anyone here who hasn't believed in Jesus before, or hasn't made a decision, or you're not sure, then let's make sure right now, all right? So I'm going to lead us through a prayer, and I would ask everyone in here to participate so people don't feel singled out if they're the ones doing this, okay? But we're going to believe and receive, and in in Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So that's what we're going to do. So let's just bow our heads. And I'm going to say something, and you just repeat after me. Jesus, I believe. believe. And I receive you. you. Jesus is Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, if you did that, everything I'm talking about today applies to you. Okay? Whether you did that today or whether you did that 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. it's, It's the same for everybody, and it happens in an instant. So we've already seen from John chapter 1, it says, when you believe, you become a child of God, and that you are now born of God. And the heart of what I'm talking about today is, if you think about in the the natural world, when parents have children, the children have some part of their parents' nature in them. And some part of them is like their parents, no matter how they, what they do. They may have their behavior quirks, or they may have features of their, their um, physical appearance that, are, that represent their parents. Some combination. That's just how it works. Well, when we're born of God, that same thing is true. The part of his nature gets put into you, and over time, as you hang around with him, you start to look and act more like him. Can we go to John 3, um, 1 through 8? It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and asked Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let's go to the next slide. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And all the mothers in the house said, No. (laughs) No way. And Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, 
Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Okay, so when you have believed in Jesus, what these verses are telling us, we already saw that you're a child of God, born of God, and Jesus said, you are born again. Now the Greek word there for, let me write that better, the Greek word for again is an unusual word, because you can also translate it equally accurately as born from above. And some Bible translations have that written in there. Born again, born from above. And then Jesus says, you're also born of spirit. So let's put all these together. When you believe in Jesus, when you receive him, you are now a child of God. That's immediate. You are now born of God. You are now born again, born a second time. You are born from above, and you are born of spirit. Now, when we get born, when, there were some people that just believed in Jesus today and, and confessed him as Lord, and they got saved. And they got born again, but they didn't get a new body right now. It wasn't a physical new birth. It was a spiritual one. Now, this is the part that used to mix me up until I learned, actually, what the Bible says about what makes up a human being. A human being is a spirit. You are a spirit, and your spirit is eternal. Your spirit lasts forever, even after your body dies. You are a spirit being. You have a soul... And you live right now inside of a body. Okay? You are a spirit. You have a soul. And you live inside of a body. I'm going to explain what each of these means. Let's just all, I'm going to say this if you agree, with, even if you don't understand it. Let's just repeat after me. I am a spirit. I, am a spirit. I, have, a soul, I have a soul. And I live in a body. Okay, so your body is pretty easy to explain. That's your physical body. It's temporary. Your physical body is temporary. You only have it while you're on this earth. But someday that body goes away, and the Bible tells us that you get a new one in the future. So you are not your body. The part that used to mix me up was I thought that spirit and soul were interchangeable. I thought they were the same. I thought spirit and soul were just different words for the same thing. But that is not actually true in the Bible. Can we go to the um, next slide? Here's, there's a lot of scriptures that explain this difference, but here's just two of them. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. The soul and the spirit can be divided. That means they're not the same. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14, Paul says, If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Your spirit and your soul are different. They have different functions. Now, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions, okay? That's your soul. That's what it's for. Your spirit, I'm going to have to be brief on this because I could talk about this for several hours and you could probably, you guys probably want to go eat lunch around 12 or 1 or 2. <laughs> so your spirit has all five senses. That's sight, hearing, smell, taste, feeling. Your spirit has a mind. The primary um, function of your spirit is communion with God or relationship with God and communication with God. 
That's what your spirit is for. So let's talk about our soul. Now, when God designed mankind, the way he made us to operate is that our spirit is the captain of the ship. Your spirit is supposed to be the one that's doing, that decides how life goes. Okay? Then he gave us our soul as a tool, and our body is like a vehicle or a way to express spiritual truths or to just interact with the physical world. A lot of us are used to letting our soul be in charge. Now, all of us know that it's not good for your body to be in charge. I don't think that's very hard to explain. Like, if my body was totally in charge, then this circle of influence would be even greater <laughs> than it is. It would be expanding. And um, I don't need to go into detail about that, but we can know if we follow the urges of our body, you're not going to end up in a good place. It doesn't mean your body's evil. Your body is not good or evil. It's just what you do with it. Your body is made to be a, a vehicle that works very well, but it is a terrible, terrible leader. Okay? Your body is not meant to be your leader. Same thing with your soul. Now, if you are, probably there's some people in here that are like me that are very analytical. And so I have navigated my life by trying to relate to the world using primarily my mind. So I work on computers, and I like it when things fit in a spreadsheet and a flowchart and A plus B equals C and um, Kirchhoff's voltage law and the Pythagorean theorem and all that stuff. I like it to fit and make sense to my logic and reason. But I want to tell you that holding a stick over the Red Sea and watching it part is not going to fit into any spreadsheet on this earth. <laughs> okay? So in order for my mind to be trustworthy as a leader, science tells you that you, you can't come to a conclusion unless you have all the data. Well, my mind doesn't have all the data. So sometimes my mind is right, but sometimes it's not. And my mind is not meant, given to me by God, to tell me what the truth is. That's not its purpose. That's not what your mind is for. Your mind is not supposed to be your leader. There can be times where God is telling you to do something, and you run the math in your mind, and you say, that doesn't make any sense, I'm not going to do that. You're submitting something spiritual to, to your mind, and that's not, that's not right. And we all do it. Now let's talk about emotions. Some people navigate life more through their emotions on what they feel. But again, your emotions, like your mind, they're not good or bad. That's just what you use them for. But if you're letting your emotions be the leader, you're, you're going to end up in a bad place. Because your emotions cannot tell you what the truth is. Right. So let me give you an example of this. It's, it's a little bit embarrassing, but it helps make the point. Um, one time my wife and I sat down to watch this movie, uh, Toy Story 3. Has anybody seen that? It's a cartoon. Somebody made it up. It's computer animation. It's make-believe. Well, we're watching that movie, and uh, it gets to the end and if you, if you haven't seen it, there's a part at the end where all these toys are sliding down this um, ditch into like a fire. And it's really sad. <laughs> and I'm sitting there watching this thing, and I start feeling really emotional. <laughs> and I'm telling myself, this is a cartoon. Somebody made this up. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. And I'm like, I am not going to cry at a cartoon. <laughs> But guess what? I started crying. <laughs> Does that mean I felt it? It's right? It's true? No, it's fake. And I know it is. <laughs> so just because you feel like it doesn't mean it's true. You can't trust your feelings to tell you what the truth is. You can't trust your mind to tell you what the truth is. They're not trust That's not what they're for. It doesn't mean they're evil. Just use them for what they're for. Okay? So when someone gets born again, when they believe in God, 
their body does not change at all right away. Neither does their soul. Okay? Let me make this clear. If I have a poor thinking pattern, if I'm thinking bad thoughts all the time, then I come to Jesus and I believe and I get saved, my thinking pattern doesn't just automatically be awesome all the time. Same thing with my emotions. If my, have, if my emotions are out of control, I get overly emotional or I have anger or whatever issues, that doesn't just automatically get solved when I get born again because it's not my soul that was born again. I was born again, born of spirit. My spirit was born again. Now let's uh, talk in, in, um, in Genesis chapter 1, God told Adam and Eve, don't eat from the tree, because when you do, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because when you do, you will surely die. Well, they ate from the tree, and they did not drop dead on their body. And they ate from the tree, and they didn't go brain dead all of a sudden. But something did die. What died there is their spirit. And the Bible doesn't tell us in detail what that means, but if you're separated, it's somehow you're separated from God and your spirit is not receiving the life it's supposed to. Your spirit is not alive in some sense. And in Ephesians chapter 2 and other places, it tells us that when you come to the Lord, you rise from, the, you rise from death into new life. You come alive. What that's talking about is your spirit gets connected back to God and begins functioning the way he designed it. So your spirit was dead in some sense, and now it is back to life. Okay? So you are alive, and you have been revived, and you don't need to pray for a revival. Because you're revived. You just need to believe it. All right. Let's see what my next scripture is. What's that? Hebrews 4.12. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. I think I have 2 Corinthians. Okay, hold on. That's good. So the Bible tells us what to do with our body and our soul. Your body and your soul is a process. Okay? It's something you have to deal with while you're on this earth. Okay, so it says in Romans 12, 1, 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, it says a living sacrifice. Now, the old joke here, but it makes a lot of sense. A living, it's a living sacrifice because it keeps trying to crawl back off of the altar. <laughs> your body doesn't like it when it's not in charge. Has anyone ever tried to fast or eat right or something, and your body's like, no! <laughs> Give me some donuts. It's a living sacrifice. Put it on the altar. Let it squirm up there. Um, then it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So your mind changes over time. It's called re getting renewed, being renewed. Renewing your mind. What that means is, is that over time, you are changing your mind, changing your thinking, so that it agrees with God more than it agrees with your surroundings. Okay? You're learning to agree with God rather than agree with what you feel like. You're letting your feelings or your thoughts bow down to the truth of God. And the truth is not going to depend on what you feel or what you figure out. The truth is going to depend on what did God say about it. So that's renewing your mind, changing your mind to think more like God thinks. Okay, so let's go to the next uh, slide. Okay, this is, a, this is an awesome passage. It says um, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, we know right there, that is not talking about your body. <laughs> yeah. 
if I'm five foot eight and I cannot dunk, and then I get saved, that doesn't mean I'm now six foot eight and I can dunk. My body doesn't change. That didn't become new. Same thing with my thinking. It's talking about your spirit. It says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us. Look at this. God has reconciled us to himself. God did that. God has reconciled you to himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now let's pause right there. God has already reconciled the whole world to himself. That is what that says. And he wants us to go tell people that so that they can respond and they can say yes to God. Look how amazing God is. Yes, I want to be in a relationship with him. It is not telling us to go tell everybody how rotten they are. That is not God's way of presenting the gospel. He wants us to implore people to be reconciled to him because he's already done his part. He has already made peace. He just wants you to receive and sign your line on the treaty. Let's go to the next slide. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So I'm going to start writing down things that are true about you, no matter how you feel about it. You are righteous. Righteous means to be in right standing with God on good terms. Righteousness is not a process. It's not a target. It's not something that you're aiming at. It's an event of your history. God made you righteous. Making yourself righteous is not your job. You do not have that ability. If you could, then Jesus died for nothing. God has made you righteous. Let's receive that. I'm righteous. God made me righteous. I agree with God. Not my emotions. So you may not feel righteous, but that your, your emotions are not the truth. The word is the truth. God says you're righteous. And um, someone said earlier, they said it pleases God that we believe him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. God likes it when you believe him. Well, if you believe that you're righteous, God likes that. That's not arrogance. When, you, when God says you're righteous and you believe him, he likes that. It pleases God when you believe him. Well, believe that you're righteous. That pleases God. Let's go to the next one. I think it's Ephesians, yes, Ephesians 4, 17 and 24. Now, when you start understanding this truth about your spirit, soul, and body, a lot of parts of the Bible start to make sense in the ways they haven't before. And this is one of the best ones. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. But you put on the new man. So it says new man. And it also said new creation earlier. Or a new creature. Put on the new man, which was created, that's past tense, according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That's already happened. God already did that to you. You are holy. That doesn't feel right, does it? You are holy. God made you holy. In the Greek, the word for holy is the word hagios. And um, it gets translated different ways. Sanctify, make holy, holiness. The idea of holiness and sanctification means that God, or sanctification means to set apart as special. That's what it means. Like if you have wedding china in your house 
and you have it on display in some cabinet, then you, that, you have taken your dishes and made them holy. You've set them apart as special. Or maybe you have a special ring or something from your childhood that has value to you but nobody else, and you keep it in a safe place. You have made that holy. That's what the word means. It's not a religious word. It means to set apart as special. Well, the Bible says right here that God has taken you and made you special to him. He has set you apart as special. God did that to you. This is what God did to you. God has made you holy. God has sanctified you. You're in God's wedding chain cabinet. Look at my awesome son and daughter. I'm telling you, God likes you a lot more than you think he does. Go to the next one. Hebrews 10, verse 10. By God's will, we have been sanctified. Or another way to say that is made holy. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Yes, that's, that's good. Let's say this I'm sanctified. I'm holy. Now, if, you're, if your body doesn't like that or your emotions, they're not renewed yet. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. You're just not used to the truth. This is true. You have been sanctified. A couple of verses later, it says in Hebrews 10, 14, by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are made holy. Your spirit is perfect. You, therefore, you are perfect. That does not make sense, does it? That's because I'm trying to put it through my mind. I'm putting it in a spreadsheet. That's not how it works. My mind is supposed to submit to the spirit. If God says he has perfected me, then that's the truth. I can't do anything about it. God already did it. Lord, I pray this just sinks in. Lord, that that door comes wide open and your light comes in and your people see what you did for them. And they believe it, Lord, that, you, that your truth is, is breaking through, Lord. So you have been sanctified and you have been perfected. That is awesome. Do you know that your spirit is not getting any better? In your spirit, you're already the way you're going to be in heaven. You're just trying to let your mind and your emotions agree with what's already been done. That is so encouraging. I'm not climbing the ladder to God's favor. Let's go to the next slide. Colossians 1.12, this is a favorite of mine. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. God has qualified you. you. That means you're qualified. A lot of people don't feel like they're qualified. Well, it doesn't matter what you feel like. God has qualified you. So let your emotions agree with the truth. Colossians 2.10, you are complete in him. You know, in, the, uh, in, in Galatians uh, 5, I think it's 22, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. All that stuff's already in you. It's already there. We just need to let it come out. Colossians 2.13, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven that's past. That's already over. Having forgiven you all trespasses. God has already forgiven you for everything past, present, and future. Because he did not forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. And Jesus kept bringing his blood in there to make the sacrifice. Jesus died once. Then he sat down and it was done. And he did it good enough. And so 2,000 years ago, he paid for all the sin 
And then he was done. He doesn't have to do it anymore. It's already handled. Okay? He paid for the sins of the whole world, even those who don't respond. But if you would respond, then you get to enjoy the benefits of it. So a good prayer... See, here's another thing. I remember when I was a little kid, I thought that you had to confess your sin. I had a misunderstanding of 1 John chapter 1. And I thought you had to confess your sin in order to get forgiven. Okay? Which this says I'm already forgiven. I didn't know this. So my prayer time at night would be, God, I'm sorry I did this and I did that. And I'm terrible and um, I messed up here and I messed up there. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) What kind of relationship is that? You just feel like a total worm. And it was just because I didn't know the truth. So now my prayer is, Father, thank you so much that you forgave me. And that thing I just did that was so wrong, I thank you that you forgave me of that already. Lord, I don't want to be like that, and I know you want to help me. But thank you that you forgave me. And see, that creates closeness with God in our perception. But God, please don't look over here too much because it's really bad. I've made a lot of mistakes. That creates distance. God wants closeness. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. I'm going to say that again. Think about that. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. The Holy Spirit is inside your spirit. And you are joined together like this. And you cannot get any closer. And God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So he's always with you. This is awesome, y'all. Let's go to the next one. Now, this one, this is a big statement right here. But it's in the Bible, so it's true, even if we're having trouble grasping it. It says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as Jesus is right now, so are we in this world right now. In your spirit, you look just like Jesus. You are just like him. That is amazing. It doesn't say we will be like him. It says, as he is now, so are we now. What in the world does that mean? Father, I thank you that we are like you. Lord, this is true, and I pray you help us understand this. Okay, so in the Bible, the way that in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, the way they would do behavior correction is they would always remind people who they were, and knowing who you are makes your behavior change as a result. This This is a big point. They didn't tell people to behave a certain way so that they could have an identity. They would tell people what their identity was, and that would affect their behavior. Okay? So biblical behavior correction always begins with reminding people who they are. That's why I'm really big on preaching on who you are rather than what you're doing wrong. Because if I can show you who you are, your behavior is going to change whether you like it or not. Now, I want to give an example of this in the Bible. Um, So can we go to the next slide? So 1 Corinthians, this is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church at Corinth, which was very messed up. They were doing things. He had to correct them in this letter of behaviors like suing each other, getting drunk at the communion. Seriously, that's in chapter 11. Um, There was a man having an affair with his stepmom. It is bad. But look what he says at the beginning of the letter. To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified. That is in your Bible too. I encourage you to look at it. Those people that are getting drunk at the communion are sanctified. He starts reminding them who they are. He says, you're special. You're set, God has set you apart as special. That's how the letter opens. Go to the next verse. 
and he starts getting into the behavior correction in chapter 3. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Carnal means your five senses, natural senses, material-minded, okay? So did you know that you can be carnal and sanctified at the same time? Anybody that grew up in a religion, that is a shocking statement. <laughs> because they were preaching on don't be carnal. But you're, you can be carnal and sanctified at the same time because Corinth was. All right, let's go to the next one. I think it's chapter 6. Okay, so in chapter 6, it's a verse that's mis misapplied a lot of times. Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he lists all these unrighteous behaviors. The unrighteous, if we can go back over here, if you believe and receive, then you're righteous. It doesn't depend on what you're doing. So in the Bible, if you ever see the unrighteous, well, something, that's never talking about you. If you believe, then you are the righteous. You are the righteous. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he lists behaviors that the unrighteous people get involved in because they don't have the spirit of God in them helping them. That, does, that makes total sense. Then he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, or you were made righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The behavior correction is, guys, you're righteous. Why are you doing like this? You are righteous. Why are you imitating people that aren't even born again? Right? He's reminding them who they are, and it's going to produce a change in them. I pray that y'all are receiving this. This will change your life. It really will. So now I want us to receive these truths, even if they don't make sense, even if it feels uncomfortable. Let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to say these, and I want you to, if you agree or if you want to agree, let's put it that way, then repeat after me, and it's okay to use your outside voice here. I receive Jesus, and I believe in his name. Therefore I, am born again. Therefore, I am born again. I am born of spirit. I am born of God. I will never be condemned. I am a new creation. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am, holy. I am already holy. I am sanctified in God's sight. I, am in God's sight. I, have, been I have been perfected. I am qualified. I am qualified. Because God has qualified me. I am complete in Christ. I am already forgiven of all sins. Past present, Past, present, and future. In my spirit, I am already like Jesus. Now, worship team, you can come on up if you would. Yes. So, to reiterate, all those things that you just said, those are true. That's the truth. It's not a mental truth. It's not an emotional truth. But it will be. And I encourage you to meditate on these things. Take one that really seemed to be meaningful to you and begin saying that to yourself. I would tell myself these things in the mirror. That man in the mirror is righteous. I'd do it. I'm telling my mind and my emotions to obey God. 
I'm telling my mind, my will, my body to agree with God. Because God is right, my feelings may or may not be right. So let me pray for us. So Father, your word is true. All of this stuff is true. It's all true. And Lord, your word does not return void. But it always produces the thing for which you send it out. Holy Spirit, I pray for, um, I thank you for this seed, and I believe by faith that it has found good soil, and that people are believing this and chewing on it and meditating on it. Holy Spirit, I, I pray you bring these things up in people's remembrance during the week. Just remind them who they are. Lord, I pray these truths would become tangible. Lord, I bless your people. And, um, and by faith, the enemy is not going to steal any of this seed. And Lord, I pray you send people along to water it, that they will hear things on the radio or see something on TV or someone will say something to remind them of who they are and of what you did. Lord, I thank you for all of the, uh, all the people that came to know you for the first time today. And Lord, we bless them. And Lord, we all, we just want you to know we are so thankful, Lord, for what you did. We just thank you so much, Lord. Thank you that you saved us, that you made us righteous. Lord, that you have an inheritance for us. Father, we love you and we thank you that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you. Um, the prayer team can come on up. I, just, I didn't want to say this. We have people up here um, at both sides of the stage at the end of the service each week to pray for you. And people get physically healed in here all the time. So if you need prayer for healing, I encourage you to come forward. Or if you need prayer for anything, you just want someone to agree with you for God's will to be done in your life, just come forward. Thank you.